a um, a son of immigrants from Barbados, Bermuda, Cuba, and Morocco. I would even recognize I have family that comes from uh, Wales and in Britain. But Jose is someone who, being raised with an uncle who was very conscious of our history as African people, and always told me, never forget who we are as Africans. My father, same thing, being raised in Cuba, but putting a great deal of emphasis upon his, our African ancestry. So for me, having family members who kept affirming the value and the necessity of recognizing who we are, it was pretty much clear that I needed to go on and study African history, study European history, study American history, even study uh, aspects of, of Asian and by uh, his history. And when I said uh, American, that would include even knowing more about Native American history or indigenous cultures. Um, I ended up going on, <clears throat> excuse me, and studying with people like Malefi Asante and uh, the late great Dr. C.T. Cato, uh, the late great Dr. Sharshi Lawrence McIntyre. Uh, I knew and worked with the late great uh, Ivan Van Sertima um, and just made a point of emphasizing what I was hearing in each of those circles which kept affirming the idea that we have to elevate who we are as African people. For me, going on and, and you know, now I, I would go on to, to teach at uh, basically Berea College, where I am now, I've been here for 16 years, teaching in the African and African American Studies program. I also teach a uh, course uh, courses in uh, what's referred to as Black psychology or African psychology. Um, I also uh, teach courses in the history department, uh, cross-listed with AFR. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so funny when you ask me who I am, because it's so awkward to talk about myself. Uh, but that's a little bit about about me. I was and I was born in in New York State, and uh, grew up there, and then moved west <laughs> to ultimately here to Kentucky. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I have to say, uh, you have really been a force um, in the African community, in our community, uh, in terms of uh, letting us know that we should not be shy about our identity. We should take it. We should own it and we should run with it. So why is there the disconnect that we have? Um, why, do we, why, do, why do so many African-Americans, or Blacks now, um, mm -hmm. as, if I may use the word, um, mm -hmm. prefer to use the term Blacks over Africans? Wow. Well, of course, I can't, uh, I don't presume to know what motivates everyone but I can tell you what I have concluded after teaching for some 30 years and studying the history and studying psychology. I would say that to a large extent, just as in the field of black psychology or African psychology and that itself, the fact that I'm going between uh, <laughs> nations, right? Is because there are those even within the field of of Africa-centered or black psychology who will debate whether we should call ourselves black or whether we should call ourselves African. But I would, would, say, I would suggest that it has to do with issues of alienation and a kind of imposed amnesia. And the alienation part relates to having been removed from the knowledge of ourselves over the course of some 500 years, for example, in the context of the Western world, or the you know, Atlantic history, if you will, 
with African people here. And so we basically didn't feel comfortable over these centuries as we get close to the present with identifying ourselves as Africans. Well, why? Well, because the legacy of our past had been so uh, obscured, denigrated, devalued, by Europeans who would identify themselves as quote unquote white, that typically most of us either didn't know anything about our ancestry, if we did, we see something very negative. Basically the image of Africa to a large extent has been so skewed again through the Western world, but also, and I recognize this, it is true that African countries, have struggled as well with their own or our own sense of identity, self-love, uh, ability to control our own resources, et cetera, which means when we look at what's happening on the continent, many people say, well, look, things are not so great there. Why do I want to identify with being of these people? Of course, that doesn't make any sense because one can say the same thing for someone who was Asian who can look at poverty in countries like Thailand or Cambodia and elsewhere, but they still recognize that they're still descendant of Asians who come from those specific countries. So I think a part of it is this idea of, of uh, like I said, a sense of alienation and a, a lack of clarity around our identity. And then the other part is we, we started out just, and again, since this is so broad, let me just deal, say, with the history of the United States. Within the context of the United States, early communities did define ourselves as Africans. The Free African Society, the Free African Schools, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, the free, the, Afri the, the free African Lodge, or, or the African Lodge, if you will, in the context of the uh, Prince Hall Masons. So I'm just using those as examples where we knew we were African people. But then you get to a point after a couple of generations where people start to identify themselves as Negroes. So now you're having Negro conventions. Then people begin to identify themselves as colored. So now you have colored conventions. Then there's a brief movement at the end of the, or really in the, in the early um, 20th century with people like T. Thomas Fortune, who tried to get us to identify again as African people and said, although he used the term Afro, but still this is the early 1900s and he's saying, get away from these designations of Negro, colored, and most people didn't use black because black at that time was seen as exceedingly pejorative. So he said Afro-American. So there's this struggle with trying to figure out you know, who we are, largely because just like I even mentioned in my book in Othello's Children, it's kind of like the, the Antaeus legend where the, this, this uh, uh, strong mythological, this, this is from Greek mythology, well actually it's Greek and Libyan mythology, even connected then to North Africa and the, the Amazigh. But this idea that being disconnected from one's source, the earth, the land of their origin, makes one weak. Mm. So the more disconnected you are from your own land, the weaker you become. Well, the disconnect for us is not just from the land, but then from the I think, as I mentioned before, when Malcolm, uh, who said, you know, if he recognized we were African people in the Americas, but at that time, he was still comfortable with using the terms Negro and or Black. But he was saying that because we're African people in the Americas doesn't mean we're no longer African people. He said if, you, if, a, if a cat has kittens in an oven, it doesn't make them biscuits. <laughs> so understanding that we're still African people here in the Americas. Why the disconnect? Bottom line, I know that's, that's uh, I mean, I'm giving a lot of information there, but I would say 
there's still a discomfort. There are those of us in the African American community, if you will, who don't feel comfortable with identifying ourselves as Africans. And there are some African brothers and sisters from the continent who don't feel comfortable with having African Americans identify even as African Americans because they'll say, you're black or you're just American. Well, they say, well, why? Well, because your attitude is different. The way you think or act is different because in Africa, we don't act like this, meaning we'll have greater respect for elders or we'll uh, uh, be, have greater respect for authority to a certain degree, right? And because we have knowledge of our identity, that shows that we have a responsibility to maintain honor because our families, we're, we're representative of our respective families. Our mother and father, we represent them. So we want to hold up the best of what that is. And unfortunately, because of the unique history, the breakdown in uh, the African-American community over the course of being here, hasn't always sustained those values. Hmm. That is powerful. Um, so actually, let me just go ahead and, and, and read something here. There's a comment by um, someone in the, in the audience, uh, Amin Patel. Although I favor the, uh, using the term, uh, the universal term African to identify us as a global people, uh, we have to also be aware of implicit bias. There are many Africans in America who use the term black as an empowerment orientation, the Black Panthers. Um, so, uh, so let's see, he goes on, the black is the ab absorption of all energies of the spectrum into one. Um, so although I'm aware of the negative con connotations in the Webster dictionary, uh, the user usage of this color, uh, there needs to be a concerned effort to aggressively engage in languaging uh, that will ultimately lead us to defining the, uh, the meaning of us as being human. So how do you respond to that? The idea being that black is being used as an empowerment orientation. Mm -hmm. I think there's no doubt that black has been used as an empowerment orientation. We think of Kwame Torre, uh, seeking to try to give a new meaning, a new uh, um, identification to what it is to be Black. But I often say that given that the language itself comes first and foremost from Englishmen, from the English world, and given that even in terms of psychology, I think I mentioned before about uh, Harvard's uh, Dr. Um, Benaji, who basically talked about with her uh, colleague in Blind Spot, how whether we know it or recognize it or not, there are implicit associations because we're bombarded, we're inundated with the negativity associated with Black. And a lot of times we're not even conscious of it. So in fact, the majority of what motivates us is the unconscious because of the cultural motifs and the way language has been used. Now it is true, because uh, clearly even uh, the people I mentioned were folks who sought to give the term black in their own mind and did a more favorable understanding. But when I think in terms of the majority, the masses of people, most people are not exposed to the, uh, the level of understanding and insight. And generally those who would focus more on, their, on our uh, uh, African ancestry and their African ancestry, they already knew they were Africans. They were comfortable with identifying as Africans for the most part. And then just use the term African and black synonymously. But I would suggest again, based upon these implicit association tests that have been done now for the last, especially within the last 10 years, it's not really working because there's still that negative association with the word black. And again, I submit, why try to take something that has all that negative baggage 
and it doesn't identify who we are. It's a reference presumably to a color, but the vast majority of us are not black. Even brother, me, brother, even you, o o o city, we're not black. If we go back to the beginning of its application in terms of how and why it was utilized, Europeans knew when they started identifying themselves as white, that the opposite, essentially, and even in their context, it has a, a certain uh, esoteric meaning as well. For example, the Templars, who were known as you know, one of these Christian uh, uh, groups that were knights in the medieval period, and refer to themselves if they lived in accordance with Christ, if they were men of honor and men of integrity, they said they lived a white and pure life. The term white was understood to be associated with divinity. The term white was understood to be uh, associated with purity, even in the context of many African cultures. The Yoruba wear white as a symbol of purity. Other ethnic groups do the same thing, right? So this is not just within the European world. But since we're using that term, and I've said, if we want to use a, a word that refers to us as people who are dark in complexion or dark olive hue or whatever, come up with it, use an African word, right? I think in, in uh, Kiswahili and Yusi or something, I think that might be the word, forgive me if I pronounce it wrong, is a reference to complexion and complexion alone. But because black has all the other negative baggage associated with it, why are we trying to turn this negative into a positive when it doesn't even really speak to who we are? Ali Mazrui, the famous Kenyan political scientist, said we're the only group that identifies ourselves by a color with the, in, in terms of, or, or uh, uh, as opposed to having some other association to nationality. Now he's talking about immigrants other than Europeans, but that's because what European who knows the meaning and the symbolism of white wouldn't want to be associated with purity. White means purity, purity is associated with God, and God is associated with the ruler of the land. So, in fact, what I just quoted is something straight out of Moorish science. And I should have mentioned I'm also uh, uh, part of the Moorish science temple, Moorish science uh, community. So I would say, yes, there are those who sought to give black a favorable meaning, but I would suggest that it hasn't worked as effectively as it, uh, as it could have if we had just recognized we are African people in the Americas. Because I say again, Asians don't identify themselves as yellow Americans. They don't speak of yellow power. They don't say that uh, uh, they're for yellow consciousness. Why are we fixated on the color? Why? Because we're stuck in a pigmentocracy. This pigmentocratic view that we've inherited from the European world and we keep using it. So that would be in part what I would say to, to our brother. Hmm. That is, that is great. So uh, this is Ubuntu a global dialogue with Africa. Uh, please uh, start uh, sending your questions in so that um, uh, Dr. Jose uh, Bay can, can address them. In the meantime, as we wait, but let me ask you this. You know, it seems like we are a minority, you know, um, here. Um, I mean, we've, in this day and age, we see the Black Lives Black Lives Movement has taken off, and of course, we 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 all agree, you know, for what it stands for, and we support that yeah. movement. Mm -hmm. But what is the way forward, in your opinion? I mean, how can we go about changing this um, narrative so that we can start using the correct terms that will help us even right. move forward? Well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because it, this is something I've been thinking a lot about as well. You know, there are people who who are commenting. Um, and I mean, I'm saying something which I'm sure uh, most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with. There have been some 
some negative assessments of the BLM, right, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Some have criticized it because they say that much of its support, if not most of its support, is coming from the same European oligarchical elite structure that imposed what we know as global white supremacy in the first place. So folks will talk about that, right? And, and you know, we can kind of, folks can kind of go in and look into that for themselves. So anytime you have um, groups that appear to be getting support from the mainstream, we should always pause for a moment and see, well, wait a minute, what's really going on here? Um, I had students tell me about um, uh, Beyonce's uh, video, I think it's called Black is King, with her latest music uh, uh, release, and this attempt to affirm Black, um, which has uh, become quite popular. And on the one hand, it's great that it's causing a greater sense of unity and consciousness. But again, the next step, and this is basically how I would approach this, if the next step is to then go completely into recognizing who we are as a people and not as a color, then that's a good thing. And I, I, I can't, or say I wouldn't you know, make a, a prophecy about what I think is gonna happen. I mean, that remains to be seen. But I wish that more people would begin asking the question, why are we identifying ourselves as black in the first place? You know, as I often uh, ha have said, you know, the first thing that we need to do is understand systems of oppression, right? And essentially, what's the motivation behind imposing white and then imposing black. Because if we understand when and why it was imposed, then we can figure out whether we need to continue to play the game in using those terms. And I would suggest that, again, on a psychological level, on a spiritual level, even on a legal level, you know, black is problematic. Black codes, right, we'll call black codes for uh, you know, a, a reason. In the context of uh, the United States as a democratic republic, democratic republics have citizens, slaves in terms of when there was slavery, and then those who were aliens either waiting to be naturalized or would be compelled to leave. So when folks looked at all the legal limitations placed upon those defined as black in this constitutional democratic republic, one can then understand why, from a legal standpoint, those defined as Negro, black, and colored were always fighting for recognition as humans, right? You remember the signs from the civil rights movement, I am a man. Yes. I am a man. Strange as it may sound, what was being revealed was that on a legal level, or I should say within the context of the law, Negroes, Blacks, Coloreds had limited rights, if not rights at all, but basically some granted privileges to function. You know, there's this controversy around the idea of when people of African ancestry are recognized as citizens of the United States. Most people assume that that would only be following the 13th, 14th, and then 15th Amendments, with the 15th Amendment, of course, giving the right to vote. People will say, well, the Constitution didn't even recognize us as people. The question I always ask is when you say us, who are you talking about? If you mean black, you're correct. Blacks were understood to be non-persons under the law. But the, the great benefit or value, for example, of looking at 
the history of the Moors or the Moorish Empire is that there were people known to be recognized Moors who looked like Denzel Washington, who were defined under the law as white. They were understood to be free and protected as citizens under the US Constitution because they had nationality. This is the same reason why you could have Native Americans who might have been treated like crap by individual European Americans in the society. But oddly enough, those individuals, if they chose to join the larger, uh, if you will, Democratic Republic, were protected under the law, could go places that quote unquote blacks and Negroes couldn't go. The famous William Dungy case in Illinois, where Dungy basically they tried to kick him out of Illinois because he said he was accused of being a Negro. He goes to court, and Lincoln proves that he's of Moorish ancestry, and then basically the case is dropped. What I'm getting at is these are the th this is the information that's in the margins of our history because we're fixated on thinking that we are only black negroes and colored folks when you understand that there were europeans who knew who we were and who we are mm. europeans who knew in the 18th century about ancient kemet egypt there were europeans who knew about the about ancient Carthage. There were Europeans who knew about the Nok culture. There were Europeans who knew about Songhai, Mali, mm. Ghana. There were Europeans who knew about the great Zimbabwe. Those who knew that and ancient Abyssinia knew we were people. They knew that the Greeks and the Romans had contact with us and that we were seen as as a great people, but a great people who fell. Mm. A great people who fell. We, like all nations fall, all civilizations and empires ebb and flow. Those individuals who knew that, knew that any arguments of us not having uh, a history or not being civilized was a bunch of garbage. But what do they do? those who were greedy, those who are motivated by power within the European world, construct a system that allows them, even as they're proclaiming the values of the enlightenment, mm. even as they're proclaiming the values of Christ Jesus, of one blood, God made all the peoples of the earth, right? Even as they're making all those proclamations, they're creating a system that allows them to still justify maintaining a system of enslavement and oppression. Now I'll say, well, that, you know, that just goes to show you. See, they're, you know, they're hypocrites. Well, there's clearly an element of hypocrisy there. But as far as slavery, all nations on the planet have either at some point in time enslaved or been enslaved. And we can talk about the different types of slavery right? African kingdoms and peoples practice slavery, but you could argue that the system of enslavement practiced by most Africans was not a chattel slavery that you would see develop in the Western world. But the point that I'm making is Europeans who were trying to present something, this noble experiment that was to be the United States said, how do we construct a system that still allows us to enslave people and feel okay about it. Well, if we can get them to not even be identified by na as nationals or by national names and to think essentially that they're made in American Negroes, then they felt better about it. They felt like they, you know, they were getting away with something. But by virtue of those of us who knew our history, and identified ourselves as such. They knew under the law, they would have to abide by the, the law and recognize and treat people under the law as equals. And again, I make the distinction. You can have a legal system 
federal system, and that's why you certain points, the conflict, and John Hope Franklin, the late great historian, talked about quasi-free Negroes who lived in southern states, but also lived in northern states. But then you see these strange anomalies of people identified looking like Africans, but being recognized by the European American populace as white in terms of the caste, right? So you have a legal caste system, but it's like living in a gilded cage because those folks then, if they move to another area, because slavery then became so uh, uh, um, pervasive with such an emphasis on phenotype, because the majority of people who would fall victim to enslavement would be people from Africa and from uh, uh, West Africa, and if you will, you know, areas below the Sahara, because people were largely having a particular phenotype, Europeans assumed that if you were African, you must be a slave. So then you have African people who are basically fighting or struggling with the authorities to say, look, don't you understand? I'm not a Negro. There's the famous case of, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ibrahim um, al sori known as uh, Rahman. Abdul Rahman Ibrahim al Sori, who was basically enslaved in, in uh, Mississippi. And once it's discovered that the man is of Moorish ancestry, he's released. His wife, however, who was born a Negro on the plantation in Natchez, Mississippi, ends up having to be purchased because under the law, she was a Negro. She didn't have nationality. She was property, right? So these are things that are part of the legal record and the other example I gave with William Dungee, but most of our historians, I hate to say, have largely failed to address this until recently. That was again, one of the reasons why I knew I needed to, to write my own book to begin to put this information out to get people thinking about. Would you please say the title of your, of your book again? Oh, uh, Othello's Children in the New World. Yeah, I didn't know it was a book. I have seen the, uh, the YouTube um, narrative that you, you, you created around, around uh, Othello, but I didn't know it was a book. So thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll go and, and check oh, it yeah, out. Yeah. So there's a question here, and again, this is uh, Ubuntu, uh, a global dialogue with Africa. Uh, and with us, we have Dr. Jose Miente Bay in the house. We're very excited to, to, to have you, uh, Dr. Pimiente Bay. Um, Pimienta Bay. Do you, do you speak uh, Spanish, um, by the way? Hablas español? Oh, no, yeah. My, yes, I am, I am able to, to read Spanish better than I can speak it. In fact, when I was doing my, my uh, master's thesis and even my dissertation, I was reading medieval Spanish, but I have to admit, I've fallen off from speaking it as much, I'd say over the last, well, since I've come to Kentucky, to be quite frank. Hey, <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. And, and um, oh, thank, oh, someone just posted a, a link to your, to your book in the chat room, so I appreciate that, uh, Janisha. Here's a question for you. Where do Afro-Cubans trace their an, uh, African ancestry to? Specifically, which countries? That's the question. Um, most Cubans of African ancestry have connections to the Yoruba, to uh, Benin, and to the Congo. All right, so those three areas pri primarily. But um, again, there will be diversity because of the fact that there, are, of course, are so many ethnic. Uh, uh, groups or, or African uh, nations who would find themselves embroiled in the conflicts occurring on the continent. But those are the three primary ones, as I recall. If you were to um, sort of give an advice to those who are listening, as far as where to begin to learn a little bit about their African 
ness. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we, if you see your your book seems like a good place to also begin. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what you know? How should they approach this study of of self and identity? Wow. Yes, and I love the way you put that. This study of self, right? Um, the ancient Chemites said, "Know thyself." Um, several African traditions talk about studying thyself, know thyself. In the Moorish context, we say, know thyself and thy father God, Allah. And in that order, (laughs) notice, and in that order, not know God first and then know yourself. That's powerful. Right. Know yourself first, Mm. then know the creator. Whether you want to say Allah or or Aludu Mare or uh, whatever term one may use in the context of, an, of, a, of a religious or spiritual tradition. Um, but know thyself, um, find out as much as you can about your own family history. One of the things that we have failed to do in the African-American community, and this is also part of the problem, I'll talk to my students and ask them, tell me something about your family. Where do they come from? And all too often, Either they don't know anyone past their grandfather, which is shocking, right? To not know anyone past your grandfather, but that shows the level of dysfunction and the breakdown Mm. in our communities, right? So when they find out that, you know, I and other folks can trace ancestors back four and five generations at least, and then we also know, a lot of the history and stories behind who we are, it's, it's a shock because it, it, for them, they're so fixated on the present. And what I say, they're so inundated by weapons of mass distraction mm. that they're distracted by everything else, you know, whether it's on the phone or whether it's, you know, on Facebook and, and often on Facebook, not perpetuating or discussing meaningful things, but gossip, but, but stuff that's not really doing much to elevate knowing thyself. So um, begin, if you can, by talking with family about history. So now, you know, we're, we're in the, um, in the uh, DNA test era, where you can go and get your DNA tested. And and although I have some concerns about some of the politics involved there, I have to admit, I have some question as to how they're analyzing some of these results. But nevertheless, um, it is some place to begin where you can find out more about who you are by doing one of these, uh, uh, whether it's Ancestry or 23andMe or whatever, right? to then give you some sense of connectivity to your own past. Because the ancestors live in you. Mm. You're only here because someone else was here before you. You didn't, you didn't, you know, come into existence out of thin air. So you literally carry your ancestral legacy in your blood. And there is a spiritual connection. That's why, of course, whether it's African traditions, Asian traditions, Native American traditions, all have some element of honoring your ancestors. Honoring your ancestors is not worshiping your ancestors. That's right. It's recognizing that there's a spiritual connection between you and your grandfather. That's right. right. Or you and your grandmother, or you and your great uncle, whomever, right? So the process of, like you said, where to begin, know thyself. And those are some ways to kind of follow along with that. Um, Take time to study our history. When I just went through a litany of different great African civilizations, be able to say something uh, more detailed than having the simple rhetoric of, yeah, I know we're descendant of kings and queens, but can't say, well, name a king. Name a queen, right? Name the kingdom they were part of. Give me some details about what was going on there. Because that's what's needed to override all the negative programming 
because we're like computers, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Or if there's good that goes in, then the good will. Uh, it reminds me. Um, I'll just uh, uh, actually I want to read a quote that I just found today from Dr. Van Sertema. <clears throat> Dr. Van Sertema, who was remembered uh, for having resurrected the history both of Egypt's Africanity, he and people like the, the late great Dr. Um, uh, Sheikh Anta Jup, the Egyptologist, the physicist, um, and I think his other PhD was in linguistics or comparative religion. But Dr. Jup, who had three doctorates all from the Sorbonne, right? Dr. Van Sertema said, in 1994, the vision of our former stature in the world must penetrate our consciousness so deeply that it begins to transform the degrading and dwarf-like habits of our present thought and action. Habits which have crippled our progress for too long. This heightened awareness of the best in our past can stimulate and inspire and heal us. This essentially is again the rationale for know thyself. Studying ourselves, understanding our strengths, and also recognizing our weaknesses. I've never studied history for the purpose of as uh, the great Dr. Milena Karenga, uh, uh, Karenga, excuse me, has often said, it, history should not be a self-congratulatory narrative. <laughs> Even as I study the history of the Moors, as great as we were, as great as we are, we made mistakes. We did things that were wrong. We acknowledge that so that we can say, well, we won't do that again, right? you recognize the best of who we are and we have to offer. And as a result, you become stronger because you're honest, you have integrity, you see the faults, you see the strengths, right? So that to me is as far as a starting point, this is a journey, right? This is a journey. It's like, you know, been walking around for so long with limited knowledge of self or almost no knowledge of self. Which is again why I think, go back to the whole reference to black. Black is kind of a safer term because if you say African, then it kind of requires to give you to give some context, right? So I kind of get it to some degree why some people on a psychological or emotional level are not yet ready to go there. But I'm also saying, yes, but you must get there. Eventually you must get to the point where you see why you are an African and not simply a color or a condition. Because clearly black is not meant to, if I already said it, it's not largely a reference to complexion. We know that, but we should know that, just by looking at the varied hues of our people. It's a reference to a condition. It's a reference to a struggle. But my point is, I want to get beyond the victimization of talking about our struggle in the context of being black. What were we doing when we weren't struggling against European oppression as free African people, part of sp specific African kingdoms, nations, empires? What was our train of thought then? Right, so. I love that. We have about uh, 14 minutes on the clock. Uh, question to you is, what would be your response to those who, who argue that but the term Africa is, was probably uh, bestowed on Africans by Europeans? The, uh, the term African, uh, etymologically, some people say it goes to um, the word Afri, which was either Latin or Afrique, which is Greek, but then there are others who say that it has a greater antiquity. 
So there is some um, uh, debate around its meaning, and I, I kind of understand that. But here's the key. Even in the context of its Greek origin, it meant the place of warmth, or it meant the place that was not cold. So let's think about it. And from the context of the European world, particularly those who were further north, they knew that when they went into this continent known as Africa, it was warm. It was lush, right? It was sunny. So the irony is there is this understanding that its application was not something negative. The irony is. Even Asian countries have names that were applied first by Europeans and it stuck. Nippon or Japan is one of them. Even the word uh, um, or the name for um, China is some derivation of a European interpretation of the name of the, of the country. So it's not uncommon. The question is, which term carries more negative baggage, right? So if we recognize Africa may have been indeed applied first from Europeans, although there's evidence that its antiquity is greater and that the Greeks got it from contact with Africans or people on the continent. And I know uh, some people have said, um, the more ancient name would be al Gebrulan, for example. Um, but the issue is you don't have the same term carrying the same negative baggage in the English language or even in other languages that are European for that matter um, as the word Africa. Somebody, is, somebody wants to know, can you provide any context to the term al Gebrulan? al Kebulan as a name for Africa, being aware that it is Arabic. Right. Well, again, that would be the context, is that it, the only thing I could say about it is that people who, who argue that that would be the proper name would say, well, but the name is Arabic in origin, which means that it wouldn't have come from an indigenous African language, um, which may be the case. Um, and this is, this is a, a more difficult uh, topic. I mean, I would probably need to defer more to those who specialize specifically in linguistics and etymology who can kind of break down, you know, this, this, whole, this whole issue. I will say that, um, you know, the idea that people in different locations, say on the continent, of Africa would have had one name that referred to the entire continent uh, would probably be a bit problematic anyway, because most kingdoms, peoples understand their, themselves in the context of whatever the boundaries are of their particular nation, kingdom, or empire. You know, you had mentioned earlier too about uh, the Moorish Empire and your background. Um, with, with, the, with, the, with your Moorish ancestry. Could you distinguish between um, the, the Moorish belief system from um, Islam as practiced, say, in, in Arabia mm -hmm. or in other parts of the world, and maybe even the nation of, of, of Islam as well? Um, one of the things that the Moorish science temple or Moorish Islam or Islamism, as we'll often refer to it as, we don't begin the religion of Islam with the Arab prophet Muhammad. Peace. Mm, that's part, I didn't know that. Okay. Yes, okay. right. Peace be upon him and all the prophets because we honor all divine prophets. Our position is that the whole notion of spiritual revelation will begin with the first human being. It's not going to begin with one particular prophet at a given point in time. So the best that we can do is to say, well, where is the most ancient record 
records where something is recorded, but we have some artifactual or written evidence of a, be, of a people beginning to create a spiritual system, if you will, or a religion that emphasizes things like ethics and emphasizes things like the responsibility of humanity to do good and bring good in the world. And it's no accident that within the context of Moorish science or Moorish Islam, we begin with ancient Kemet or Egypt. We also recognize the antiquity of the uh, Indus Valley as well, so Indian civilization. So that's one huge difference. And as I say, even though honor is given to the Arab prophet and all prophets, and of course, even to, to, to Jesus, and of course, in Arabic, Jesus is Isa. And the reason is, we're saying, let's go to the beginning. And since science even tells us that the beginning of humanity is coming somewhere from the region of East Africa to Western Asia, and this is before the break, you know, I mean, we're talking about a, 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 a region that has people who are dark in complexion. That's why people will talk about the people in the Indus Valley or Indians very often being a darker complexion than many Africans on the home continent of Africa. So in effort to reconnect the African and Asian and indigenous world, to know that we are one is another thing that's emphasized. Plus, in the context of our understanding of Islam, we also believe in reincarnation. So our position is that, yes, people will come back. You are born again into this world. The idea is to do a good job here, learn your lessons, so that you don't have to come back. Or if you come back, you come back to do some good to improve the conditions, right? So some will criticize that and say, well, that's not the teachings of, you know, al-Islam, Sunni or Shia. You're right, it isn't, because those traditions have, a, have their own understanding, which is absolutely fine. But the idea of what it means for us when we talk about um, Islam, whether it means being at peace or submission to the will of, of Allah or God, you know, again, being at peace. There's a science to finding peace, spiritual peace. And that means living consciously. That means doing good in the world. And the sources of that can be found in Nile Valley teachings that relate to, for example, Ma'at, that can be found also in Sanskrit writings in the uh, Vedas in the Indus Valley, right, going again and in, into antiquity. And so for, for us, that also means that you will have examples of other prophets. For us, our prophet in these days is Noble Drew Ali, who brought this unique understanding of Islam or Islamism uh, to our people here within the Americas. And it is the more science temple that comes before the nation of Islam. Because the more science temple is an older organization. And there were influences that would go over to those within the nation. The more science temple also comes before um, Daddy Grace, Father Divine, right? Again, spiritual movements which were meant to empower our people by seeing our own divinity, removing this notion that um, God is a European male, because that is also a form of psychological and spiritual warfare. If we're convinced that God, when God came to the earth, in the form of a man. He was a European man. That creates all kinds of problems. Now, it would be different if one said, well, at one point in time, God came in the form of a European man, but here are other examples of 
Africans who came, uh, uh, who basically manifested as God, Asians. In other words, you see this equity across the board. And then you say, oh, so all of us are made in the image and after the likeness of God. But the ubiquitous nature of the way that Europeans interpreted the teachings of the Nazarene or the teachings of the Christ, the ubiquitous nature of presenting I call Jesus of, of Norway instead of Jesus of Nazareth, right? All over the, you know, the world, so much so that uh, back in the 90s, there was an African-American actor who was playing Jesus in a Christmas play on alternate nights. And the people uh, who were going to the theater, somebody called in a death threat. They threatened the people doing a Christmas play because this man who was of African ancestry was playing Jesus on alternate nights. <laughs> those, you know those calls didn't come from African people, or I dare say, or Asians or Native Somebody who was of European descent called in those death threats to this particular theater shows that those who understand systems of oppression and how they work and how you maintain power said, if these people start seeing divinity in themselves, we're in trouble, meaning the European power structure is in trouble. Even if we see divinity in ourselves and are doing good in the world, right? Because it's still the idea, wait a minute, these people got off the mental and spiritual plantation. They're now actually seeing that they are close to the divine, they may actually start to live it. They may actually start to act it out. They may start loving their brothers and sisters. They may stop killing each other. They may stop stealing from one another because they have no real love and appreciation for who they are. And once that happens, we're in trouble. Because guess what? We are not minorities. The largest population on the planet is Asian and African. But we're convinced, we're convinced that the largest population on the planet are Europeans. And so we call ourselves minorities, which also has another meaning in terms of we're minor in significance. And I would say that a big part of that thinking is related to our spiritual understanding or misunderstanding because we are convinced very often that God is this other guy. God or, or the divine doesn't reside within us, right? And as long as we believe that, we never reach our potential. The ancient Chemites knew it when they deified certain uh, um, individuals who did great things in their own pantheon of deities. Right? Asar, Aset, Heru were understood to be part of that. So all of this is, is vital. We, like I said, getting off the spiritual plantation. Once we understand this about ourselves, and for us, and I'll just say this and then I'll stop, um, one of the simplest ways for us when we define who Allah is for us, we say Allah is the father of the universe, the father of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. So we give a specific definition to what Allah means to us. So it loses that abstract element that often exists. So that when we think of that which fathered love, what's not to like? We think of that which fathered truth, that which fathered peace, that which fathered justice, that which fathered freedom, right? We're saying this is the spiritual force that we seek to connect with and manifest through us. That is powerful. And that's our time. Uh, that was deep. Oh, okay. That was amazing. Thank you very much, Dr. Jose Pimienta Bay for coming. And by the way, I didn't mention this. Um, Dr. Pimienta Bay is one of uh, the members of our Council of Elders at Osiri University. We, we use an African uh, term, Omukuru. So thank you so much, Omukuru. Uh, 
uh, Dr. Pimienta Bay for coming. This has been amazing. And I, I, I hope to invite you back again because there's so much more we have to um, uh, unpack. I even have a question I, I want to ask you because if you're going back to Kemet, I'm just wondering why didn't you all use uh, the name of a god from, from that language as well? Or why don't you, you include some of that into your, into your science? But that is uh, going to be a conversation for an, an, an another time. Uh, I've learned a lot. I want to thank the audience who stuck around because they've been here for two hours just waiting for you to, oh. to learn because I started one hour the, uh, before. So thank you. Somebody just said Dr. Jose is a profound scholar. And yes, that's why we have him on here. I appreciate you so much. Thanks to everyone for, uh, for, for coming. Dr. Jose, Ubuntu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.